Good morning to the Honorable Ministers of the Council, members of the media, online viewers, radio listeners via St. Martin Gov Radio 107.9 FM and respective radio stations island-wide. I'm Rolika Roach and welcome to the live Council of Ministers press briefing for today, Wednesday, August 7th, 2019. At this time, I invite the Prime Minister and Minister of General Affairs, the Honorable Leona Romeo Marlin to address you. Prime Minister. Good morning to St. Martin, good morning to my colleague minister, members of the media, good morning. I have a one update from the Ministry of General Affairs following on of that, the National Recovery Program Bureau, an update on the projects of, that fall under the trust fund. We have the emergency project one, Activ activities are still ongoing under the private and social home repair program. Repairs to the first batch of 14 seriously damaged homes has started and is progressing well. 26 homes with minor repairs has been technically assessed and the NRPB director has informed that the awarded contracts for the supervising engineers and the main contractor, both local companies, will be signed within a few days. The principal aspects to these minor repairs are mainly repairs to the roofs, replacements of windows and doors. These works will be executed with minimal inconvenience to the homeowners where possible. The bid-in process for the remaining homes of those who have qualified for repairs is still ongoing. The Bureau will be issuing a separate press release to inform the general public on the process. The emergency repairs to the social housing managed by the St. Martin Housing Development Foundation is also nearing its completion. As everyone is aware, resources from the trust fund through the NRPB has been allocated to this project. In addition to the financial reimbursement to the St. Martin Housing Development Foundation for expenditures related to hurricane repairs that were executed from their operational budget. As it relates to shelters, I was also informed that the director of the National Recovery Program Bureau will be signing the contract with the supervising engineer firm and main contractor for the repairs and improvements of 13 shelters, eight main shelters and five recovery shelters. These works will Im immediately commence. The Ministry of Vromi has played a critical role in this process and I thank them for this. The NRPB is also finalizing the contracts for the repairs of the Radio Sound building. It is expected that the contract will be signed within a week. Once started, the works on this critical building should be completed swiftly. The preparations of phase two, or the second phase of the repair of the Phillipsburg and Simpson Bay Police Stations has started. This phase concerns the repairs of the roofs and ceilings, interior walls, and is funded by the trust fund. During these repairs, the electrical and mechanical installation of both stations will also be redesigned and installed. However, the funding for these works are from the insurance proceeds and the Ministry of Romi is responsible for these works. A total number of 136 new firefighter suits for St. Martin Fire Brigade have been ordered. And finally, the NRPB has informed that its official website will go live this week. You can find details and progress of the trust fund projects, active and upcoming tenders, in addition to the information on events and much more. I encourage everyone to log on and keep abreast with the happenings of our recovery process. As it relates to VSA, I have the following information. ESF 7, which is public health, has have the following tips for hurricane preparedness for families. For this season, we are urging the public to also ensure that they are storm ready. And some tips are to stock up on essential emergency supplies for each member of your household for a minimum of 10 days. Four liter to one gallon or one gallon of water per person per day for drinking, cooking, and sanitation. Non-perishable foods such as canned items, baby food, pampers and formula and wipes. Hygiene, cleaning products, medications, prescription drugs, etc. A more detailed list can be found on the government webpage www.stmartingov.org or via our new app. Family evacuation and communication plan needs to be in place. 
pre-packed emergency evacuation bag for each member of the household. An evacuation bag should include one to two bottles of water depending on the person's ability to carry supplies, non-perishable snacks, emergency contact lists, wipes, tissues, change of clothes, including socks and flashlights. Prescribed medication and a medical supply such as inhalers, glucose and blood pressure monitoring equipment and supplies. The most fit member of the family should hold a larger bag, which includes more water and food, clothes, first aid cake, kit, and important documents. Home protection, products, shutters or plywood and watertight containers, plastic bags. Persons who have not prepared, shutter, pre not prepared shutters should do so and not wait until a storm is approaching. Using heavy duty plastic containers and bags is all always a great way to secure person's personal belongings. Ensure your house and car insurance, which includes flood insurance, that they are updated. Trim trees and shrubs around your home. Clear loose and clogged rain gutters and downspouts. Know how to shut off water, gas, and electricity in case you are instructed to do such. As it relates to shelters, the tips from ASF7 for persons who feel that their dwelling will not be a safe place to stay, to stay, it is important that you begin to make plans to stay by a friend or family. In the event you are unable to stay with friends or family, everyone, regardless of resident status, is allowed to make use of government-operated emergency shelters. Shelters should be at a last resort, and, should, and each person should walk prepared. When asking what to bring to a shelter, it is listed, the, fo the, listed, the following are, are listed. Two liters per person per day for two days. Non-perishable foods in cans or sealed containers enough for two days. Special dietary foods, baby formula, manual can opener, paper products and utensils. Baby supplies, so clothes, diapers, formula, bottled food and blankets. Extra clothes and shoes, wash clothes, towels, soap, toothbrush, paper towels, and toilet paper. Sleeping bags, blanket and pillow, and lightweight portable lounge chairs. Rain gear, medication, and first aid supplies. Identification and valuable papers. Activities for kids, flashlights. What is prohibited in these shelters? No pets are allowed, no alcoholic beverages, drugs, and weapons, no household furniture. Strict security measures would also be enforced, and those not following shelter rules can be detained or asked to leave for misconduct. As the government remains committed to being prepared for possible natural disaster threats, we are hereby encouraging the public to also do their part to ensure that their families are safe and better prepared as well. I await for questions from the media. Thank you, Prime Minister Romeo Marlin, for your opening remarks. At this time, I invite the Minister of Justice, the Honorable Cornelius De Weaver, to address you. Minister Weaver. Thank you, Ms. Roach. Good morning to my colleague ministers. Good morning to the press. Good morning, St. Martin. Just a brief update on the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force. Uh, we, as you know, uh, this week I was last week I was in the Parliament debating three of the laws. It was the Penal Code, the Penal Procedure Code, as well as the Civil Code. Uh, just to give a little background, the CFATF is managed by a board, and each member country has the voting rights. We were extremely fortunate to have been given until November for member states to vote again but we have a lot to do in the meantime. Besides getting these laws passed in Parliament, they have to be ratified, implemented, as well as translated into English in order for CFATF to evaluate them to make sure that they are, they are compliant with their recommendations. The National Risk Assessment will also measure the effectiveness of the laws, and we have already engaged the World Bank to assist us with such. The misconception that we can just talk to the organization and use hurricane as a reason for the delay cannot be used any longer. And it will definitely will not fly because we already escaped an hour vote and that leniency will not be granted again. So we look forward to making sure that these laws are passed 
Um, understand that these are not my personal laws because I think we always have to separate the two. These are laws that have been pending since 2014 and, and back. As far as the recommendations from CFATF, that's been since 2012. The laws have been worked on since 2014, but we have to be compliant and, and ensure that we are not listed or get a public notice. So I look forward to the debate next week, Monday, and moving this a step further to approval. Just an update on the MLC, the Miss Lally Center. The special ordered security doors have arrived and they are being adjusted to ensure that they are being properly installed. The special toilet and basin combo have also been delivered and these are being installed with the coordination of the arrival of a water pump necessary to guarantee the correct bars needed to for the right pressure and the suction. Just an update on the Point Blanche prison as well. The interior of the cells are being painted by the inmates themselves, and this is being coordinated aisle by aisle. Once this has been completed, then we will start with the epoxy, and the bunk beds as well will also be painted just like we have improved the Phillipsburg uh, police cells and holding cells. We are also fixing up the Point Blanche but it was important that the roof was fixed first and now we can work on the interior. The washing machines have also, have also arrived at the Point Blanche facility. They're being installed while the electrical and the drainage adjustments are being made. We look forward to that being completed as well. And the fence has been delivered on site and the site clearing around the fencing area will be done and completed as well. So we have a lot going on in the detention facilities. Finally, I'd like to echo the GB announcements that have been made regarding what we call behind the cake house area. Because in order to protect the grid of GB, they will be installing fuel sizes based on the cable rating. This will be done at the source, which is the transformer station. They have also advised the residents of that area to restrict the use of unauthorized connections to homes that have not been legally inspected by the Vlomi Inspection Department. This will avoid disconnection of the electricity supply to that area. Should this occur, occur reconnection will be done the following day. Again, these are measures being taken to prevent electrocution as well as any fires. On behalf of the Minister of Vlomi, I ask all residents to please comply with them as well. And Again, on behalf of the Minister of Romy, Minister Gitterson, the letter to the Regional Authorizing Officer of the Ministry of General Affairs, the letter granting permission for the usage of the area of parcel CA 021-1975 for the development and reconstruction of the MPO shelters has been signed off by my person on behalf of the Minister, and we look forward to that construction starting and again, preparing us to be Hurricane ready. I thank you, and those are my comments for today. Thank you, Minister DeWeaver, for your opening remarks. The Minister of Finance, the Honorable Perry Hearlings, is present at press briefing, however, will not be making any opening statements, but is available for any questions the media may have. We now move on to the question and answer session. Alita Singh of the Daily Herald, you have the floor. Good morning, Rilaika. Thank you very much. Good morning to the Prime Minister and Minister De Weaver and Minister Kerlings. My question, I think, would span over the Prime Minister's portfolio as well as that of the Minister of Justice. The Inspectorate of Health has issued um, uh, a statement saying that they will allow uh, permission for the use of medical marijuana. Um, has any requests for uh, permits come in as yet, license? And how will this all be policed, considering our capacity at the moment to police just in general? How will we police the importation of the items? If I could um, begin, number one, as I'm not aware of any permits being requested, that would be through the Inspectorate of Public Health, Social Environment and Labor. Dr. Best would be the one that would be responsible for that as well, as well as the economics department because they would ask for licenses. But the policy in general is strictly a public health matter. Um, it is done by the inspectorate, which is, a, which is an independent body, and is really regulating the medicinal use of cannabis. Um, it does not 
touch or even discuss the possibilities of recreational cannabis. So we have to be able to differentiate the two. And I know a lot of people are getting excited, but we're not there yet. <laughs> the policy in itself is also, should I say, fluid, because as more research and data becomes available, they may adjust the policy as well. But this is definitely one based on the current and existing laws. It's just the policy based on that. So that's all it is. Thank you. Thank you, Minister DeWeaver. Lyndon Brown of BCN TV, you have the floor. Good morning to the people of St. Martin and to the ministers that are present here today. Question to Minister DeWeaver. Minister DeWeaver, is there any truth in this matter that um, the, the law enforcement officers that are here from Holland their salary is superior than the local officers. Is there any truth in that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Brown, for your question. I believe this question has been asked in Parliament on numerous occasions. Uh, the, the salaries that they get paid is what they get paid in Holland. We're not contributing to salaries. What the government of St. Martin is paying for is simply for their per diem, hotel, car, and transportation. This is the same amount that we would pay if our officers went to the Netherlands, for example, to follow courses. So it's a simple exchange that we have. The, um, as far as salaries, I've heard otherwise, and I've actually heard uh, our local police officers say that they wish the Dutch were getting what they were getting. So I, I'm not sure about them having the same salaries at all. Those are two different things. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I will allow a follow-up. Yep. Minister, it is, um, it is good for this platform because a, lo a lot of times um, everybody, uh, everybody becomes reporter, everybody becomes ministers, everybody have the answer. But it is, it is good that you can explain to the people of St. Martin because out there there's a lot of um, analysis on this matter. I'll accept your statement as it is. Um, I, I think I believe I've clarified it, so thank you. Thank you, Minister DeWeaver. Stephen Cerellin of PJD2 Radio, you have the floor. Prime Minister, Ministers, good morning. My question is for either the Prime Minister or the Minister of Justice. It's pertinent to Vrami. Um, road markings we have not seen in quite a while now. The um, traffic light is still not operational and as far as the old government building what's taking place there can you provide some information thank you stephen as it relates to the traffic light i believe that um, the minister was busy with that advice so i think within short we should hear something concerning the traffic light in that specific area or wherever he was um going to put it. I remember that we spoke about it in the Council of Ministers and it was ordered. I can, I can state that. That's what we got. As it relates to the old government building, we have, um, at least for my person, I haven't spoken to the Ministry of Romi as, in ho uh, as a whole and also to Facility Affairs Department about the demolishing of that building, especially in light of the peak of the hurricane season coming up and we want to make sure that it, it's not a threat for any of the households or other buildings around there. We were told that um, within short that it would be demolished. I believe it's supposed to be within a couple of weeks that will be demolished. I had to be actually to tell you the truth last week, so I have to actually follow up on that. Was what was the holdup? I believe probably the rainy season that we, the, rain, the rainy um, days that we had um, recently, but the idea is to demolish th that building before the peak of the hurricane season. If I can add to that, Ms. Roach, um, thank you, Mr. Cerulean, for your question. The road markings as well as the potholes which have been featured on the front page of the, one of the daily newspapers, um, those are just things that were pending, waiting on the approval of the budget. Um, that also played a factor in many of these uh, issues that you were addressing. So now that the budget has been passed, there is still a report that has to come from Parliament and it still has to be published in order for us to actually go ahead and execute what we have to do based on that law of the budget being um, accepted and published. 
Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you, Minister DeWeaver. We now move on to the second round of questions. Aliza, you have the floor. Thank you again, Rolaika. My question is for the Minister of Justice. You mentioned in your opening statement about the Mislali Center. Could you give a general update on the status of that center and when it will be put back in full use? Is there sufficient personnel for when it will start? And uh, generally, you know, what is the timeline? Thank you, Ms. Singh, for your question. The Ms. Lally Center is almost on schedule. We had a slight delay with the doors, but that we are trying to make up on time as far as the installation of them. So that's also being done. As far as the staffing, we have already started recruiting new staff, but we are also in discussions with, for example, the Dr. J Foundation to provide additional services to our youth who are being um, held at the Miss Lally Center. And uh, the small delays that we have experienced, but we hope that in the next week or two that they will all be finalized. Um, we'd have liked to open it about a month ago, but with the delays, it has caused us to push it back to when, what we call opening around the school period time, so which is probably by next week or the week after, but we would like to have it ready by then. Thank you. Thank you, Minister DeWeaver. Lyndon Brown, you have the floor. Kristen to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, um, recently, um, St. Martin have, have a grand time, 10 10 10, where a lot of people said if St. Martin pull away from Curacao, um, St. Martin will be sustainable with taxes and so forth. Um, Minister St. Martin become country. But um, last week I was listening to the, the Minister of F Finance and um, he did not satisfy with the enforcement of the Dutch, like the Dutch want um, the ministers and parliament to cut their salaries, and they're doing, they're doing it in a forceful manner. So, and the conversation where St. Martin become country, um, when should the Dutch engage in St. Martin affairs? When should be the point of engagement? Thank you for your loaded question. <laughs> when should the Netherlands be engaged? Well, I'm sure that you know that there are some things that are not within our um, authority. So some aspects that when it comes to defense. So in matters when we have a disaster or we're in a crisis to be corrected, when we're in a crisis and we call a state of emergency, then and only then, the, they can intervene depending on the type of assistance we request. So they will engage then. As it relates to our finances, when we are in financial uh, challenges, I am sure that we, you know that we are governed by CFT, who is then governed by the RFT, and matters in those cases, they can intervene like they did with Curacao. So it depends on the specific and the severity of the matter. It, at times, the Netherlands can intervene when it comes to financial matters and matters as it relates to defense. Thank you. Minister Heerling. Yeah, uh, thank you, Rolaika. I, th I think um, uh, based on the question of Mr. Brown, um, we are part of the kingdom of uh, the Netherlands. Um, and based on that status and our autonomous status uh, in 2010, 2010, we agreed to a certain uh, uh, way of how to operate as an autonomous country within the kingdom. One of the agreements we made then is to, uh, to have a kingdom law on financial supervision for obvious reasons and uh, a supervisory body to make sure that uh, that law is adhered to and that we work accordingly. Um, the Prime Minister mentioned that we are governed. I just want to make sure that the word govern has many uh, interpretations, but it's not governing our country, but it's making sure that it's managed according to the rules of the, the kingdom law. Now. Uh, we also have the Kingdom Statute that also provides uh, for each country in the Kingdom to um, 
help each other out when it's most needed. And uh, the way you pose the question uh, is virtually like, you know, can the Dutch just walk in and take over and tell us what to do? Uh, that is definitely not the, uh, the, the, the purpose of having all these agreements uh, uh, signed off between, uh, between all of us. But as the Prime Minister mentioned, when it is really a matter of urgency of our threat of collapsing of whatever within each one of the countries, then it's possible to help each other out. And that is the context within which these agreements were agreed upon in 2010. It's uh, the, the, the context is to help each other out and to make sure that things become sustainable. That's why we have the Kingdom Law on financial supervision. We have a history of bad financial management in our country. And uh, the Kingdom Law is there, managed by the CFT or supervised by the CFT to come to a sustainable financial household for the country of St. Martin. Thank you, Minister Heerlings. Stephen Cerulean, you have the floor. Ms. Roach, thank you. Prime Minister, um, the post office is a well known since they have moved to the new location. They had some financial challenges. Um, they were also seeking to do the services of, um, I think it was MoneyGram. Can you provide a status update as to um, where the post office is at now? Thank you, Stephen. Before I um, answer that question, I just wanted to add matters relating to foreign affairs also is something that is governed by the Netherlands. So just wanted to add that. The post office. Yes, indeed, the post office has been experiencing some financial um, challenges for quite some time. And the government has assisted the post office in paying out the severance pay to all of the workers that were left off. And that continues. That is a promise that we've made to them. And I want to thank the Minister of Finance for assisting us in, in those matters. They have a long way yet to go because they do have outstanding bills from other entities that they owe. As it relates to MoneyGram, MoneyGram is one of the areas where they see that it's needed so that they can be able to generate funds to be more sustainable. And of course, they want to be less dependent on government as well, which is a right way to think and try to find ways to um, ensure that they are having sufficient money to be able to operate. MoneyGram, I know that they had a challenge as it relates to some banks wanting to or not giving them the, the, the license. They are still negotiating such, and I haven't gotten any update as it relates to whether the, the, the entity that they have approached, whether that entity has says yes or no. So I believe it's still um, in negotiation. As soon as I get that information, I will make sure that the public has it. Thank you, Prime Minister. Alita Singh, you have the floor. Thanks again, Rolaika. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Uh, you've mentioned several times on and on again of, uh, about the financial state of the country. Uh, my question is two-part. One, you've called for better tax compliance. Have you seen a uh, better um, payment of taxes by taxpayers? And another source of income, of course, is income from large companies. However, there are certain companies, I am not sure of the number, and that's where my question comes, um, how many larger companies, or even smaller ones, still have tax holidays? Thank you, Alita. Um, on your first question, um, what we have seen since uh, uh, the devastation of the hurricanes is um, a good compliance in, uh, from those who were able to conduct business uh, nevertheless, uh, paying their taxes. And the reason also in talking to the business community, they also understand, uh, and, and Hurricanes Irma and Maria uh, kind of exposed it, that once you reach a, a status of, of, uh, of emergency, there's where they start to realize, a lot of people then, um, how important it is to have paid your taxes. Um, but there are no, there's no data available at this point in time to give you an exact answer on 
that I see a rise in, uh, in uh, compliance because, of course, there are still businesses that are non-operational. A lot of businesses are out of business and some businesses are uh, partially uh, operating. Um, but this is one of the uh, projects that are, uh, which is included in the uh, tax uh, transformation uh, plans of action, is to collect the data to make sure that you have the right uh, um, ICT software in place that you can collect the data. Uh, so that's bringing the whole tax uh, situation on a, on a higher level where it should be. Because for us, it's very important to have data available to move forward in a sustainable way, the way uh, Mr. Brown was uh, referring to. Um, on the second question that was, uh, Alita, again, on the tax holidays. Um, we have issued, uh, we have approved so far uh, three, four tax holidays to major investors, uh, and that lies more in the area of the hotel uh, sector. Um, but tax holidays, um, as a matter of fact, it is kind of proven that tax holidays does not really deliver uh, the, the monies that you would like to see to the country. It actually um, costs you money. And uh, the whole tax holiday system that we have for the past decades, um, that's why we reached at the point that, you know, uh, it's time to do away with uh, that facility. Then the hurricanes came and then you notice there was a demand for it. But the question always remains and that we can only find out at the end uh, of when the projects are finalized and the taxes are filed to see what it delivered us versus what it delivered the, uh, the community that requested the tax holidays. Um, yeah, there is a, I don't want to call it a false uh, misconception uh, that tax holidays really um, generate uh, much more interest of foreign investors. That is really not proven, but it is also, it, it provides at least a mindset because there are more, there are other incentives that this government uh, has to offer. So in that sense, um, yes, we are happy that we um, were able to provide for the tax holidays so that at least there is some relief in the reinvestment made by the hotels uh, that were already present and the ones that are still to come. But we still need to find out at the end of the day, you know, what uh, um, it cost the, the coffers of, uh, of the country. The mic. Sorry. Uh, look, just a follow up. The properties are the companies that have received these uh, tax holidays, and uh, what is the period for those? Five years, ten years, uh, less? Um, well, the law uh, allows you up to nine, ten years uh, to have that uh, tax holiday, and it's around 2%. Uh, you will pay 2% profit tax but only on the part of your operation that falls under the tax holiday, so not the overall operations of the enterprise. So if you invested in additional 10 rooms in your hotel, then whatever monies you make on the 10 rooms, there's where you have the 2% uh, uh, lower profit tax fee applied to. The rest falls under the normal tariff of what is it, uh, 33, 34 percent. So uh, that is so that calculation at the end of the day we still have to make, but it is not an overall. So I don't I want to make clear that it's not an overall thing. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, yesterday in the Council of Ministers we uh, had a discussion, and um, even though we approved these tax holidays but it was a general sentiment uh, also voiced by the Prime Minister that we would like to see that when investors come to St. Martin and we as a government provide them certain incentives to do so, that they also take into consideration what is it that they can do back for our country. You know, and, I, and we were contemplating you know, towards education, the youth, you know, do something, a sponsor or come with a, you know. So, um, 
and then you can go in a variety of directions you can think of you know legislated but you don't really want to go there and make it compulsory but i think it should be something that we need to discuss when permits or permission is requested for holidays this is what we would like to see uh, back from you so um, we are certainly uh, moving into that direction uh, as well and taken into consideration for sorry uh, what was with the companies uh, so far uh, Maho uh, Alegria Diffy Little Bay and um, the new development at the uh, Great Bay uh, Beach where the former Great Bay Beach Hotel Resort was uh, sorry yeah, all of them uh, were damaged, severely damaged through the hurricane. Mm -hmm. And um, so those are the ones, so are the re recipients so far. Thank, Thank you, you, Minister Hearlings. Lyndon Brown, you have the floor. Question to the Prime Minister. Um, Prime Minister, property, the word property is on the front burner. Um, we have heard um, several times the Anti-Property Foundation will highlight property St. Martin, uh, uh, are presently facing poverty and more poverty. Um, what more can St. Martin do? Does St. Martin have the financial um, strength? And I believe also that more people came in after uh, um, Hurricane for Understand. Um, how, how long and how much money does St. Martin have put aside to help um, poverty? Another loaded question. I, I, I get where you're, you're, you're going with the, the, um, your question. You know, it's something that we really have to really think about. The first being is that the Ministry of VSA, indeed, they have, um, we, the government gives social welfare to those who qualify. And after a while, you have to, we, you heard the minister talk about at times we have a cap, and we definitely have a cap for 2020, so there's but so much you can spend. Then we have to look at the aspect of how many persons are asking for social um, welfare, and I'm sure people will ask for it only because they can't do any better. We need to look at the anti-poverty issue of St. Martin from a more holistic view because it's not only a VSA issue, but it's a holistic issue. We have immigration aspect, we have VSA aspect, we have the financial aspect. So this is something that we are busy looking into. I do know that um, VSA through the trust fund is busy looking at the, um, the poverty level through a program that they have um, engaged in because we need to know where we're at at this current situation. So assessments need to be, take place for us to understand when we speak about poor people in St. Martin, who are we speaking about, which categories, and, 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 and based on data, then we can make some more sound decisions and take a, a more strategic approach as to how we're going to tackle the matter. Indeed, we can't finance everything and um, we would want to, to make sure that, you know, there is some form of progress in eliminating poverty on the island. But at the end of the day, and, you know, having hurricane, the hurricane that passed two years ago didn't help the situation either. So I'm sure that um, all of our ministers are busy looking at every aspect of how they can assist in addressing the issue so that we can have a better approach or more improved approach on the matter. But indeed, we will work first from having sound data. Yes, we're, the Ministry of General Affairs is also busy with the Sustainable Development Goals and the anti-poverty issue is one of the goals, one of the SDG goals. And so that, that's why I say that it has our attention and it is a priority, but we need to look at it from a more holistic approach and we need data. Thank you, Prime Minister. Stephen Cerulean, you have the floor. Uh, 
My question is for the Prime Minister. Um, I was hoping that the Minister of ECYS would have been here to answer the question. Nonetheless, he is not. Prior, he stated that uh, the repairs to the various schools would have been done in a timely manner for the reopening of schools. Um, re reopening of school. Um, the new school year officially starts as of Monday. Um, where are those repairs now in terms of students returning to their classrooms on Monday? Thank you, um, Stephen. Indeed, we had the a discussion yesterday in the Council of Ministers. The minister did brought it to our attention, specifically for a school that will open a little later because of um, the repairs not being concluded. I, I'm, I'm going to state this again. It's, 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 we received a lump sum of insurance monies, which also includes the schools. At the time, the former Minister of Education requested for the most vulnerable schools for it to start the um, for them to receive funding the schools were then given the, the identified schools were given the money to start the, the repairs were they given all of the monies no because the insurance did not give us all of the monies that um, we were supposed to have that is still being discussed disputed negotiated all of the three besides that the minister of education has requested funding from the trust fund and that took some time as well i do know that he w he managed to put a project in for i believe it, it's the total value is about 35 million to assist in the repairment of schools and bringing schools up to par post hurricane i am not proud of where we're at right now when it comes to school repair. And so definitely one of the talks that we spoke about is whether we should leave the schools through their subsidy, pay for their own insurance, and then not leave, you know, because when we received the monies, we received it in a bulk, but it was not only for schools, it was for the government building, for, dif for different, asp different things that we were insured for. So we are in a dilemma. So the talk is right now, or the discussion is, whether we would leave the schools, pay for their own insurances, and see if they can, and because that's something that the, some of the boards did discuss, and our, the discussion was there. But we're looking for a solution for it, and I'm not happy. I have voiced my opinion as well with the um, NRPB, with the World Bank Steering Committee, the members, that we need to escalate the process, because Hurricane is here, Hurricane season is here, number two, school is about to reopen, and you know we really don't want that situation for our children. But this is the reality that we're, we're faced in, and we're doing everything that is possible to make sure that we get the rest of the insurance monies so that the schools can have those monies to finish off what they need to finish. But am I proud of it? No, I'm not. I'm definitely not proud of it. Am I happy? No. I have voiced my opinion time and time again, and so have the other ministers that this process, when it comes to emergency repair, needed to be escalated because here we are faced next week, school, children are going to go back to school with um, schools still damaged. Thank you, Prime Minister. We now move on to the final round of questions. Alita, you have the floor. Thank you again, Rolaika. My question uh, dovetails into um, the issue of insurance. Uh, Prime Minister, you just mentioned that you're still in, in a way waiting for some insurance money. Within a month, will be one year, I'm sorry, two years before, um, after Hurricane Irma. How much money is still outstanding um, for government? And uh, going into that, the airport also, um, what is the status with the um, loans, um, the loans that have been approved for the airport, the uh, 100 million, and when can we actually see work start there? Because of course, we also have insurance issues there as well. Alita, as it relates to the amount that has been disputed, I don't have the ev exact figures right now, but I know definitely the amount that was quoted from before is definitely what we will not accept. So hence the dispute or the discussion. As it relates to the airport, I will leave the Minister of Finance answer that particular question as he is directly involved via the government or on behalf of the government for it. 
Thank you, uh, PM, for passing it over. Um, Alita, uh, as we all know, um, there is quite some uh, insurance payout um, in a account uh, from the bondholder at the, uh, at the airport. Um, and that is exactly one of the uh, points um, that we hopefully have finalized now. Uh, we have been busy the past weeks to come to a form of a agreement because there are a lot of components in getting the, uh, the um, financing together. The financing, the amount, that was one part. The other part is how do we go about release and getting released the insurance proceeds that were paid out to the airport according to the contract that is there um, the, the insurance proceeds were paid into a uh, an account that is managed by the bondholder and the bondholder is the one that decides when to release it back to the airport for uh, uh, whatever reason in the in the uh, re reconstruction of the airport um, I believe that we will be able to finalize, uh, to come to a conclusion with the bondholders on that, because once we have uh, put some guarantees in place, which we did in the meantime, uh, we committed to that, uh, we need to sign a so-called concession agreement uh, with a, uh, for that reason. And that the, the purpose of it is, is then that out of the insurance proceeds, funds will be released that will be earmarked to be used together with uh, the, the, the 101 million uh, for the reconstruction of the airport. Um, so we are trying to, uh, to put the, uh, the dot on the I right now to finalize that. And then we have to move to, uh, to procurement, you know, uh, put the bid out for the contractors to do it, and then we moving forward to so I have no, I can't give you an idea on when we will see yellow helmets and yellow fest walking in a building, but the, 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 the contract, the agreement that is in the final phase now um, to satisfy um, the, some of the uh, concerns of the bondholder. Um, and then we can move to the, uh, to the procurement of, uh, of the project. Thank you, Minister Hearlings. Lyndon Brown, you have the floor. Question to the Prime Minister. Uh, Minister, in your discourse, you mentioned um, about the hurricane preparedness. And um, what I want to, um, to remind you of, uh, ministers, Minister, Prime Minister, the well, there are a lot of wells and St. Martin. Do you have any plan to identify these well and um, make notices um, and give certain precaution that um, this well water is not for human consumption, what they can use for, and uh, maybe have a group to clean around this area. I can't remember exactly how much wells are there, but maybe you might have that, um, that information. So give us some um, analysis on that matter. Thank you, Lyndon. Indeed, um, last week we spoke about the wells where um, I indicated that this is not the first time when I gave the announcement that the inspectorate has, state, has made a statement or made statements indicating that our wells on St. Martin are not safe for um, drinking or for, um, and it's indicated in my last statement that the well water is supposed to be used or can be used for washing cars and um, um, your, your gardening, et cetera, et cetera, but not for bathing and not for drinking purposes. The and I also indicated that indeed you, the water has to be treated. One of the things that we indicated when we, we started to meet as a EUC group was for us to look at the well waters and have them tested and have them retested because they've been tested before and they are unsafe. So again, we're warning the public or bringing, making this as a, an awareness for the public to be careful when using well water. So um, yeah, indeed, the plan is for us to go out there and, and, and make sure that 
all drinking water or all water usage is sa are safe, but this is something that the Inspectorate of Health are busy with, and time and time again, they do put that information out there. But indeed, how many wells are on St. Martin? That I don't know. I will have to inquire. But nevertheless, um, it doesn't matter the, the amount of wells that we have, but what matters is to ensure that our public knows or the public knows that what they can use that water from. Thank you, Prime Minister. Stephen Cerulean, you have the final question. Thank you, Ms. Rich. My final question is for the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, with the uh, motion of no confidence against the Minister of ESA and the resignation of the Minister of Vrami, um, can you provide some information, if you may, as to how close uh, is the process to at least seen a minister of VSA and that of Rami being installed. Thank you, Stephen. We are closer to getting a minister of um, Vromi, so that process is um, almost finalized, and we're still um, in the process of the for getting a minister of VSA. In the meantime, the minister of Justice is the replacement the Vervanger for the Ministry of Vromi and um, yeah and I am currently the acting minister of VSA until a new minister has been found for this ministry. Um, if I, I may follow up, um, has anyone been identified to, to fill in the post? The, we have received names for the Ministry of, of Romi, and I, I think I will hold on on that until the f a follow up is, is needed on that specific question. As it relates to VSA, um, at this place, yes, as it relates to VSA, that is still an ongoing process. But I will definitely let you know once the time is, 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 here, is right, once the time is right, correct, once the time is right. But thank you for that question. Thank you, Prime Minister, Honorable Ministers of the Council, members of the media, online viewers and radio listeners. This brings us to the end of the live Council of Ministers press briefing for today, Wednesday, August 7, 2019. For rebroadcast, tune in at 7 p.m. on St. Martin Cable TV. For video on demand, log on to the official government's website at stmartingov.org. On behalf of the Department of Communication, I'm Rolika Roach and wishing you a pleasant day further.